Amen. Welcome to our afternoon service. We're so glad that you are here this afternoon. We went outside, we hooked up all the equipment, and the wind was blowing so hard. It was blowing in the microphones, and it just wasn't working. So uh, it it's better for us to meet here uh, than to fight the elements outside. We're going to begin by singing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory. 496. If you have a church hymn book, sing along at home as well. This will be live streamed this evening. 496. I heard an old, old story. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him he to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his precious power revealing how he made the lame to wash and cause the blind to see and then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior for He me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood I'm the last i heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and somehow sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood let's pray together our heavenly father we're grateful for all of the blessings that you've given to us day by day and we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to uh, sing these praises and lord to look at your word and to learn and to to grow in our Christian life. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would to take those steps forward. And Lord, we know the devil is there to push us back. And I pray you would, you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray your word would fall on good ground in our hearts that it would grow. And may you be glorified uh, with our response to your word this afternoon. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing Only a Sinner, 474. Only a Sinner, 474. Not have I gotten, but what I received, grace hath bestowed it, since I have believed. Not have I gotten, but what I received, 
grace hath bestowed it since I have believed. Boasting excluded, pride I abase. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. All right, we're going to sing that last verse. If you're able, you might have to step on your tippy toes, but see if you can hit that note. All right, on that last. Suffer a sinner whose heart overflows. Loving his Savior to tell what he knows. Once more to tell it, would I embrace? I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. And we're going to sing the Lily of the Valley, 447, 447. I found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. I have found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Don't forget to hit that hallelujah right, on the chorus on the second. He all my griefs have taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach my goal. Hallelujah, he's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A while a fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, I'll see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning, fairest of 10,000 to my soul. Amen. We're glad that you're here for our afternoon service. Again, if you're watching this in the evening, this is a copy from our afternoon service. We got weathered out. Say the wind was too much and we couldn't uh, get the gear set up. But we're glad that you're here and uh, remember to pray for each other during these times. Pray uh, if we could for each other's safety and uh, pray, of course, for our church as we move forward in these times. Good to have a blessing to have a visitor this morning, first time visitor. And it's just a blessing to see God at work uh, in our lives and the lives of others. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting because. God works in tragedy and, and things that, you know, we wonder what God is doing. God is obviously at work. And uh, it's, um, 
I think it's just a blessing that during the pandemic, there's lots of negatives we can point out, but uh, one thing that's a blessing is the fact that the Word of God uh, is being streamed and is on the internet and you know it, it's a blessing to know that the word of God is getting out and uh, I know the individual that came uh, this morning said that they had watched the live stream for several weeks before uh, they came to the service so it's just a blessing to be able to get the word of God out and uh, it's a blessing that we uh, even though sometimes we feel like we're standing still and we can't take steps forward uh, with God on our side, you're always taking steps forward. And so we just uh, trust in him and know that God is at work. We're going to make a change to our service. Uh, the time of the afternoon service is coming to an end. Uh, it's just getting cooler and it's not going to be practical for us to have the afternoon service. And so to transition next week will be our last afternoon service. So next week will be our last two o'clock service. Uh, Brother Marr is going to be preaching for us during that service. I, I want him to have the blessing to know what it's like to preach in the wind and try to get your notes straight and, and, and get lost. You know, it's it's good ex experiment, a uh, good experience for him. Uh, but he's going to be preaching our last two o'clock service next week. And then here's what we're going to do. We're going to move into uh, two morning services. So we're going to have a nine o'clock in the morning service. And then we're going to have 1030 morning service. And we're going to have uh, the morning service will transition out before 10. And then we'll bring 1030 will be our second service. And so we'll give you more details about that. But that's what we're looking at. Uh, and then we're going to live stream our evening service for now. And then our Wednesday service. And then we'll transition to in-person services for those. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing uh, moving forward. Last Sunday, or next Sunday, sorry, will be our last outdoor two o'clock service. So remember um, that. Uh, please be in prayer for our church. As I mentioned uh, uh, this morning, uh, we were, our church was robbed and several things were taken from our shed and uh, they took the Cadillac converter from our bus one of our buses. And so the police have been called. The report has been made. Uh, but um, obviously it's in God's control. And uh, uh, just continue to, to pray. I know uh, some of, have already donated uh, to meet those needs that have been taken. Uh, we lost a, a grass trimmer and a pressure washer, a leaf blower, and of course a Cadillac converter. <laughs> I don't even know what a Cadillac converter is, but I know it's important and I know that you need it. Uh, so anyway, be in prayer that these needs would be met. All right, we're going to continue to sing 376, Take Time to Be Holy, 376 before our message. Take Time to Be Holy. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word, make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing, his blessings to sing. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive 
beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Amen. Let's take our Bible. This Wednesday on our live stream, uh, Pastor White is going to be preaching for us. And so I hope that you'll tune in on Wednesday at 7 o'clock for our live stream as Pastor Wyatt uh, will be uh, preaching for us. I know that uh, you'll be blessed by his, his ministry and also uh, by his message. Uh, when we return to in-person services, obviously that is the goal, uh, to get back to in-person services for our Wednesday and Sunday evening. And when we do that, um, I want to get back to the messages, the sermon uh, series that we, we started and then COVID hit and we did not finish. Wednesday, I want to get back to the book of Revelation and continue that series. And then, I don't know if you remember, it seems like ages ago, but I started a series on marriage. And we were going through that series Sunday nights, Sunday evenings. And so we're going to continue that. We're going to get back into that uh, when we transition into in-person services. And that is obviously the goal uh, is to get back to in-person services for Wednesday and for Sunday night. Um, but we want to take those steps slow and just make sure that uh, everything is smooth as we get there, before we get there. Uh, all right, we're going to turn to 1 John chapter 3, if we could. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, as I was thinking of that, that sermon series that we had begun and, and had kind of got interrupted because of COVID, we talked about marriage, uh, I thought about this passage of scripture in 1 John, and I thought about for uh, a moment the, the, the love of God, and uh, this message kind of came about because of it. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 and uh, we're going to begin our reading in verse number one. Uh, we're going to look at the love of the Father, love of God, and, and what it means for each of us. Notice what the Bible says. We'll read just uh, to begin here the first three verses. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Behold, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And when we read this, when we read this passage of scripture, we see a lot of various truths the fact that God is at work in our life, the, the fact that God has a finished product in our life, the fact that we have a hope in our life. And all of this stems from verse 1. All of what we have in the Lord comes from His love that He initiated to us on the cross. And that is how the writer of John, that's how the writer John begins this message. Behold what manner of love. And we're going to, for a moment, think about God's love and what it means for each of us uh, today. Let's pray. Lord, again, we're grateful for all that you've done for us, and we're thankful that we can come uh, together, Lord, around the, your word and, and around the same mind that we want to grow, we want to learn. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to look at these truths and, and Lord, to, to make it personal for our life. Uh, not just to take it generically that you are a God of love, but Lord, that you are a God who loves us. And I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, help us to uh, have that confidence in our life each and every day. We're grateful for, for all that you've done and who you are to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The love of God, the hymn writer said, is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care. 
God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Now when the Bible says here, behold, it's calling our attention to a truth. Behold, he says, what manner of love. Now for a moment we can just jump over that thought. We can just keep on going. But what the Bible is doing is separating the love of God from all stereotypes or all uh, ideologies of love that you can think of in this world. The Bible says, what manner of love, and the thought there is this unique love, or the idea is a peculiar love, or this out-of-the-world love. What manner of love, what out-of-this-world love, the Father hath bestowed upon us. And when we talk about the love of God, it's hard for us to truly understand it. Ephesians 3.19 says, And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. And so we're talking about something that it's hard for us as finite individuals with limited wisdom and limited ability to comprehend. It's hard for us to put the love of God in a, in a perfect picture. Because oftentimes the love that we think about or the love that we know about is often clouded was sin. And it truly is not a picture of the love of God. Now when we talk about God's love, the Bible uses a Greek word for this love, the Greek word agape. And it is a sacrificial love. It is a love expecting nothing in return. It is the love of God, the agape, for God so loved, for God this love, this sacrificial love gave his only begotten son that whosoever Believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The agape, sacrificial love of God is beyond our knowledge. We talk about love for just a moment and you're going to have to push aside everything you know about love and what Hollywood teaches you about love and you know what, what the world would describe love as being you have to understand what the Bible teaches about love. First of all, love is a choice. Love is a choice. 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. Now, that may sound normal to you. But remember that when God loved us, we were yet sinners. So God showed love to us when we were unlovable. He chose to love us. When we had rejected him by a sinful nature. That's why the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 verse 21. When Jesus is talking to the, the rich young ruler. And he had turned away from God. He had turned away from the Savior. He wanted to trust in his riches. And yet the Bible says in Mark 10 21. That Jesus beholding him. Even, know, even knowing Jesus knowing that this 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 young man would turn from him and turn to his riches and trust his riches and not trust in him. The Bible says that Jesus beholding him loved him. That's the love of God. I mean, you wouldn't choose a spouse to love a spouse. You wouldn't give your love to someone if you knew in your foreknowledge, if you had that ability to be able to, to have the ability to see the future, you wouldn't choose to love someone that you knew would not love you back. You would make that choice. But God made that choice. And that, that choice is only because this agape love that God has. This love that is a choice. Now the world will say this. They'll say something like this. Love is not a choice. Love is a feeling. That's what our world will say. And they'll say, well, you can fall in love and you can fall out of love. Now, listen to me. Love has various emotions. But love itself, the essence of what love is, is not a feeling. It is a choice. That's why Jesus said this, love your enemies. How, how, you don't have a feeling of wonderful, you know, of, of butterflies flying through the air for your enemies. 
You don't have that fuzzy feeling that the world would, would use to describe love for someone who curses you and persecutes you. No, you have to make a choice. And that's what Jesus is saying. You choose to love them, no matter what they do to you. No matter if they persecute you. He says, pray for them that, 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 that uh, despise you uh, and persecute you. Pray for them. You make that choice to love them. And so, the reality is, is that love is a choice. And Christ chose uh, to love us when we were sinners, when we were enemies. He made that choice to die for us. You know, when a married couple are having a difficult time in their marriage, uh, they may say something like this. They'll say, well, I just don't, we just don't love each other anymore. Now, the reality is what they're saying is that they make the choice not to love each other anymore. And whether it's because of bitterness or sin or lack of submission or whatever the case is, that that is a choice. It's not a feeling that faded. It's a choice that was made. And Jesus chose to love us. When we were unlovable, he died for us. And this is what love is. Love is a choice. Don't let the world tell you anything different. Love is a choice. We must choose to love. Number two, love is a verb, which means love is an action. That's why the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave. Look at that. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Because the very expression of love is to give. It's to sacrifice. It's to put the, uh, excuse me, to put the interest of other people ahead of yourself. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So love is an action. <clears throat> love is a choice that is, is made. The world will tell us that love is a display of emotion. And yet the Bible says that love is giving. Love is sacrificial. Love is giving of oneself. Asking nothing in return. That's a good definition of love. You could write that down. Love is giving of yourself. Asking nothing in return. The Bible says that Jesus gave of himself. Now, love is a choice. Love is a verb. Now think about this. Love is God. The Bible says, He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. God doesn't have love. God doesn't possess love. God is the essence of love. In other words, the definition of love Cannot be separated from God. For he is love. He is the creator of love. And without him, you can never truly understand what love is all about. You cannot describe love without God in the equation. But the world today would say that they know all about love. Hollywood would say, well yeah, we know what love is, is all about. And a television screen will picture what the world's love is all about. The world's love is a fickle love. The world's love is an, a love based on emotion and a love based on feeling. The world's love is a love that does not last. You know, you, Hollywood, and I'm not recommending it, but on television in Hollywood, a man will travel from one relation to another, from one marriage to another. And, and uh, you know, they'll say something like this, I'm just looking for true love. We're just looking for true love. And yet they will never understand what true love is. What love truly is. The essence of love. Without being introduced to love himself. Jesus Christ. Because he is love. Now with all of that being said. The apostle John here is helping us to understand love. And because of the love of God. He's teaching us what it means for you and me. I've said this before, but when I was a teenager in Sunday school class or teen class, I remember a, a Bible teacher telling me, when you get to John 3.16, take out the world and put your own name there. For God so loved Jerry that he gave his only begotten son. You know, I, I just truly believe this, that if you were the only sinner on earth, God would have sent his son to die specifically for you. Because he loves you so much. And he died for you to express that love. And because of the love of God, it allows us to enjoy some wonderful blessings. 
It enjoys us to, it allows us to enjoy some wonderful, significant benefits. I know, I don't know if, if you're a sports fan or not, but a lot of sports have returned again. And uh, they're, they're playing with empty arenas. And I, obviously they're doing that because you can't, you know, I, I, I'm not sure the exact number, but I'll give you an idea. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs arena, uh, which is where they're playing all the Eastern games in the NHL, I think it holds around 30,000 people, 30 some thousand people. And I mean, you can't put 30,000 people together. It'd be chaos and it would be dangerous as well. And so they are running the games with no fans present. And I often, when I'm watching a hockey game and there's no one in the fans, no one in the, in the stands, I often say to my wife, man, I wish I knew the janitor of that building. He could get me in there. I could sit in one of those seats, you know, away from no one to even see you and you could watch the game in person. I, I wish I knew someone that had the authority to give me the benefit of being able to be a part of that arena, to be a part of that game. I'm glad I know Jesus Christ. Because by knowing him, there's some wonderful benefits of being a Christian. And I'm glad I know all about his love. I'm glad I've experienced the love of God in a personal way. And because of that, John here is talking about what, what, has, we, have, what we have gained as children of God because of the love of God. And I want us to see this if we could. Number one, if you're taking notes, uh, write this down. Because of the love of God, God's love has transformed us from being God's enemy to becoming God's child. Now, I'm not going to get into the theology of salvation, but it is an incredible transformation to be once called the enemy of God and to now be called the, the child of God is by far the greatest miracle that God has ever performed. I mean that God who is holy, who, who cannot look at sin, uh, you, you know, who is, who is light and, and in him is no darkness at all. To accept a child of darkness and to wash our sin white as snow. That we would become one of his own, that we would be born of God is truly incredible. It's amazing. The miracle of transforming us from a sinner to a saint to becoming a child of the king is just amazing. And the Bible says here in our text, in the very first thought, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Behold! This is a, a big announcement. This is something that demands your attention. Behold what out of this world love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called his child. We are the children of God. He is our heavenly father. Let that sink in for just a moment. We are a child of God. He is our heavenly, oh, he is our heavenly father. The Bible says in Galatians 4, 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of, uh, of his son into our hearts, crying Abba. The thought there, Abba, means daddy. It's an endearing, t uh, an endearing term. It it's a personal term that we can say to, to God, Father, Daddy, I need your help. I have this need. That, that, that's how close he is to us. Romans 8 verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We are a child of God. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2. Wherein in times past, you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom... Also, ye had your conversation in times past, and the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherein he loved us. The Bible says, what made the difference? The love of God. The wonderful love of God, that we were an enemy, that we were by nature the enemy of God, that we were on a course heading to hell, and, and most of the time we didn't even know it. And yet, because of his great love, we become a child of God. 
and a part of his family. You know, they say that a child will take their perception of God from how they see their father. And we have to understand that that statement, um, though I understand the thinking behind it, is not an accurate statement. Because we as humans, as fathers, we fail. The reality is, is that we come short and we disappoint. I probably disappoint my children at least once a month. <laughs> the reality is that we are flesh and blood. And, and we don't always make the right decisions. And, and, and we come short of the standard that God has set. But listen to me. Though we as fathers fail, God never fails. God never fails. The reality is, is that, that we can trust Him and we never have to doubt Him because, because God always knows the answers and God always, His pathway is always right and His pathway is always good. And, and even when we as fathers try to discipline our children, the Bible even says that we can become inconsistent and we can, we can do that with wrong motivations, but God always disciplines with our benefit in mind because the reality is, is that God never fails, God won't fail, and, and let me make it personal, God will never fail you. He'll never fail you. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never fail you. You can always trust in me. What does it mean to have God as our Heavenly Father? Well, I think it means that He'll guide and give us grace. He'll guide and give us grace. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. He offers grace to help you in, in the time of need in your life. He will discipline us and direct us. He'll direct us to do uh, what, is, what is best in our life, and he'll chasten us because God does that because he loves us. Because he loves us. And he's going to support and, and sympathize with us. The Bible says that for we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And so we can come boldly before the throne of grace, and we can receive that grace and, and help in time of need, because the Lord knows and understands what we're going through in our life. And so the love of God, uh, the love of God, number one, we see, uh, that the love of God is there to transform us from a child of the devil to a child of the king. Uh, to transform us from an enemy to a child. Number two, God's love finishes or creates a finished product. Okay, here's what I want us to do. Put up your hand if you've ever started something and not finished it. <laughs> Lots of us, if not all of us. We, we are um, excited, right, to begin a project. Have you ever just been so excited to start something? You're like, yes, on Monday, it's diet day. <laughs> and then Monday comes and you don't quite make the cut. So it's next Monday. <laughs> you know, Monday never comes. <laughs> The reality is, is we're excited to start, but we struggle to finish. You know what? God's a finisher. And God doesn't just begin, God finishes what he starts. And God has begun a good work in us. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing that he, that's the Lord, which hath begun a good work in you. We'll perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He began a work and he's going to finish the work. Look what the Bible says in our text here in, in John chapter 3 and verse number 2. The Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it, does, uh, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, he is. God's love creates a finished product. The joy that was set before the Lord Jesus was the transformation of a sinner to a saint. 
And that work began at the cross the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus. The Spirit of God moved in your heart. And listen, the Lord is going to complete that work in the day of Jesus Christ. We shall be like Him. This speaks here of, of the rapture, of the carrying away of Christians. When Jesus uh, comes, the Bible says there's going to be a, an amazing transformation that takes place in our life. Now there's three things you have to understand. Salvation is a new birth. All right, that's the moment you put your faith and trust in the Lord. And that's not a process, that's an event. All right, you should know that the moment you put your faith and trust in the Lord, you should know the time. It's a, it's a new birth. All right. Uh, sanctification is a continual work of the Lord, spiritual growth. And, and, you know, the Lord's still working on us. The reality is we're not quite sanctified yet. And so the Lord's at work. And he's cutting off those rough edges to make us to what we ought to be. Uh, to bring him glory, by the way. And glorification is the time, the moment, when we have a glorified body. Free from the effects of sin. Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and that's not talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Paul writes to the church at Rome, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The, the sin of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, listen, we're going to set aside this old sin-cursed body. How many are struggling with some aches and pains? Yeah, I mean, we have them. This year, on October 22nd, I turned 4-0. The big 40. Someone said to me, it all is downhill after 40. I thought it was all downhill after 30. <laughs> That's a big hill. <laughs> you know, as I get older, I'm discovering muscles I never thought I had. Because <laughs> they ache and they're sore. And I, I don't think I'm old, by the way. Well, maybe. It, it, you know, age is kind of relative, don't you think? I mean... It's all perspective, I guess. The reality is, is that we're all aging. And our bodies have aches and pains. But listen, one day all of that will be gone. We talk about the glorification of our body. We'll receive a new body. All things will be changed. And we shall be like the Lord. We'll have a, a glorified body like the Lord Jesus after, after his resurrection. What a wonderful blessing that will be. When we have that glorified body. And this is because of the love of Christ. You see Jesus gives us that victory. That victory. And he's going to finish the work in our life. Someone said to me. 10,000 years from this very day. All of us will be very much alive. And we'll all be in heaven. And we'll have a glorified body. And we'll see the Lord face to face. And we won't have any more pain, we won't have any more coronavirus. All of that will be gone. The Bible says the former things, the former things will be, will be gone. And we'll have a glorified body. And this is because of the love of Christ. That when Jesus died on the cross, he saw our salvation, he saw our sanctification, and he saw our glorification. That one day, they'll have a glorified body. I'm going to finish the work in them. I'm going to finish that work. I'm glad that Jesus is a finisher. Amen. I'm glad he finishes what he starts in our life. A glorified body is an eternal body. Not under the sin's curse. It is a, a wonderful, wonderful glorified body. We shall see the Lord. What a wonderful blessing that will be. Number three, it'll be done. God's love gives us a great hope. Look what the scripture says in verse number 3 of our text. It says, every man that hath this hope in him 
purifieth himself even as he is pure. What hope is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that we'll have a glorified body. That one day we'll be with the Lord forever. And where does this glorified body come? It comes from the love of God. Because God is a finisher. And because God started the work because of the cross and his love toward us. That one day we'll have a glorified body. And that therefore we have this hope in our heart. A wonderful hope. I heard the story of a, a town, a small town, and uh, the town was called uh, Flagstaff. And uh, this small town uh, was kind of in the valley, and they had directed a large mass of water toward that town. They built a dam, and in six months, the government officials in that town had made uh, the directive that they were going to flood the entire town. They had made the decision that they were going to create a large lake there. They needed the pathway of water. And so everything that was in that town was going to be destroyed. Well, for the next six months, nobody cared about anything. I mean, homes never got painted. Yards never got mowed. Repairs to their house never got completed. I mean, their attitude was, what's the point? to be underwater anyway it's all going to be destroyed anyway what's the point of investing anything in this place and oftentimes in the Christian life we can have that terrible attitude throw up our hands and say what's the point I want to remind you that we are created as an eternal being and the reality is that as a child of God we have hope today it doesn't matter what pestilence is in our world. It doesn't matter the financial condition of our world. It doesn't matter the, the, the job, uh, jobless percentage or the unemployment percentage. The reality as a child of God, no matter the external circumstances, there's always hope in the Lord. There's always hope in the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you ignorant, brother, uh, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And obviously the thought there is speaking of death. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of those who had passed on, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Our world today has no hope. Has no hope. Uh, the reality is, is that people are, are within themselves searching for more. They're looking for more. But at the very core of their being, they are hopeless in everything they do. And yet, as a child of God, we have hope that one day we're going to see Jesus. <laughs> we, have one, we have a hope that one day this life will be over, and one day we will be like Him, and one day we're going to have a glorified body, and, and one day, it'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. And so, listen, we paint the barn and we do the work because we're not going to live our life as others who have no hope. We're going to do the work because Jesus is coming again. And we have hope in Him. And we trust in Him. The hymn writer said, By and by, when I look on His face, beautiful face, thorn-shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. More, so much more. More of my life than I ever gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. Listen, I believe all of us are going to have regrets. But we want, little, we want the, the least amount of regrets as possible. And our heart ought to be always. Lord, we have hope in you. And so we're going to serve you to the very end. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Look to him. I heard the story of a man who was sentenced to death. And he obtained a reprieve. By assuring the king. That he would teach. His majesty's horse. How to fly. He was given one year. If he could teach. His majesty's horse, how to fly, he would be released as a free man. And someone asked him about it. And this is what he said. He said, well, the reality is within a year, he said, the man explained, he said, the king may die. He said, within a year, I may die. Or he says, the horse may die. Furthermore, he said, maybe, who knows, the horse may actually learn how to fly. <laughs> 
In other words, he says, listen, what other choice do I have? I'm glad the Christian life is not like that. I'm glad that we can be confident and we can know the Lord that we serve and the hope that we have. And we don't have to, you know, fly off the seat of our pants and hope so and, 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 and you know, just hope in circumstances or, 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 or things aligning in the right way or being in the right place at the right time. I'm glad we don't have to worry about any of that. But our, our life is in the hand of the King and we are His children. And because of His love, we have a great hope today. The reality is the love of God turns us from his enemy to his child. And the love of God finishes the work that he started. We'll have a glorified body one day. And the hope of God gives us a hope, a wonderful hope that this world can just, they just don't understand. To know that God is in control. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for all that you've done. And we're grateful that we can learn from your word and we can know uh, Lord, that you truly love us and that we are your child. And Lord, though we fail you, uh, Lord, you don't give up on us. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you love us. You care about us. And Lord, that you finish what you started in us. And I pray, Lord, that each of us, that we would be reminded of this very truth. As your word teaches us to be kept in the love of God, to be always be reminded of your love, Lord, help us. And Lord, I pray that you would go before us this week. May we bring glory to your wonderful name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, 483, in our hymn book, 483. As we close our service, 483, Oh, How I I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. That sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. On that second verse together. It tells me of a Savior's love. Who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me on the third it tells me what the Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, leave sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. All right, we're going to sing on the last verse when we get to the course. The piano's going to drop out. We're going to sing an a cappella. On that last, let's sing it out now. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in his sorrow bears a part. That none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Let's sing the chorus again. Here we go. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, 
because he first loved me. Amen. God bless you. I hope that you'll join us Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Brother Wyatt will be preaching for us. I know that you'll be encouraged by his message. God bless you.